Good afternoon. Um, my name is Dodie Fump, and I'm a member of the Stonington Garden Club. And we are thrilled to co-sponsor this afternoon's talk with the library by our famous farmer, Craig Floyd. Craig is a 10th generation farmer from Stonington, where his family has been farming the same land since 1712. That's pretty impressive. His own farm, Footsteps Farm, was Connecticut's first certified humane farm. As farm manager for the Denison Piquatsipos Nature Center's Coogan Farm Campus, it's a mouthful, um, Craig oversees their giving garden, practicing regenerative, no-till, no-spray farming techniques, and managing hundreds of volunteers, some of whom are here today. All of the produce grown in the garden is donated free of charge to the Gemma E. Moran Food Bank in New London to help feed the 32,000 food insecure people in southeastern Connecticut. Craig is passionate about improving the soil and healing the planet through healthy food. In today's presentation, Craig will shrink many years of experience and higher learning into a 45 minute flyby. He will help us understand the earth saving advantages of regenerative gardening and explain how to boost production while bringing back better taste and nutrition. After our Q&A, um, Deb Dodds, our club, club president, excuse me, will briefly tell you about our upcoming Gardens by the Sea walking tour on June 10th and 11th here in the borough. So without further ado, please welcome Craig Floyd. I pay her a lot of money to t tell um, stories about me, you know. And you're ready to go. Thank you. So why should you care about regenerative farming? In 2014, the United Nations put out a worldwide alert that at the current rate of soil degradation, we have 60 years of soil left in the planet. We're finished, done. Why is that? And because of plowing and tilling, um, which is counterintuitive to growing things. It doesn't make any sense. But uh, we're gonna cover that on a, on a small scale um, for the home gardener. And it doesn't make any difference if you're trying to grow blueberries, apples, dahlias, zinnias, lettuce, cabbage. Um, regenerative farming can really um, improve your yield and especially your, your color. We've got this marvelous garden tour coming up <clears throat> and I don't know if there's a competition or not, but if, if someone was using regenerative methods to grow flowers, their flowers would be more vibrant and, and larger than someone else growing the same kind of variety because we don't really grow um, plants, we grow soil. It's all about the soil and the microbiology in the soil. Um, and, then, and then the soil will grow the, will grow the plants. So we'll, I'm gonna go through this relatively fast to make sure that we got time for your questions. I love questions. Um, just hold them to the end, if you would, please. If you get me sidetracked, I'm liable to go off on a tangent somewhere and we'll lose my whole kind of thought here. Um, we typically have over 300 volunteers um, each year. This year, we've got more than ever. Um, that number of 32,000 food insecure people in New London County, um, that's actually pre-COVID. So now um, the, the need is exponentially higher. I was at the food bank the other day and, and they, they're running out of stuff. Um, they don't have any meat to give to people. Um, and, and you never know who can end up being food insecure. It doesn't make any difference whether you're driving a Jaguar, an Audi, or, or Mercedes. One day something can happen and pretty soon you don't have no idea where your next meal is coming from. And the food you all are eating anyway is crap. Because your food has lost up to 50% of its nutritional value since 1940. It loses another 30% within three days of coming out of the field. You're feeding your children and your grandchildren food that is 80% deficient. God not, did not design our bodies to work on that low amount of nutritional quality. And one of the biggest things that regenerative farming does is it really exponentially increases the the uh, nutritional quality of the food, which is typically important for the people that are food insecure. So we're at 162 Greenmanville Avenue. There's a big blue tractor in the front yard. 
Um, in the next two weeks, there's going to be a big carrot sign in there because they've challenged me to see how many pounds of food we can put out this year. And they're going to track it with this big carrot thing. Uh, so it's kind of cool. Um, we'd love to have you come and volunteer um, to help us, but also for us to help you um, because we can really change your gardening life no matter what it is that you're growing. Um, so you're going to be able to see this online and you'll be able to see the Jot Forum link um, to sign up. Or you can follow us on Facebook if you want to do that. Um, or you can, just, you can just come see me and, and ask questions uh, because I do love questions. Um, it's best to text me. Um, I'm working constantly, seven days a week, and um, I can't hear my phone. I'm really hard of hearing, and so and I, I have it on vibrate, and I don't feel that either if I'm driving the tractor. So if you text me, then I can answer you, um, and and that works out works out pretty well. So thank you so much, Madam President, for ha for having me here. This is a big deal. Um, I don't know how many people know that Deb volunteers in the garden. She is an absolute beast in the garden. <laughs> She works hard, hard, hard. I've never seen her cleaned up before. <laughs> so she works. She works very hard, and we re, we appreciate everything that you do for us. So thank you. Um, so this is going to be a this is going to be a, a high altitude flyby. We're just going to touch the surface. I mean, there's going to be so much that we we just don't have time to talk about. Um, we're going to talk about what is gen, gen, uh, regenerative gardening all about. Um, the soil test. Adding minerals like azomite, carbonatite, basalt, and biochar. How often do we feed the garden? What about foliar feeding? Um, spacing. Our spacing is different. 60 inches between our tomatoes. So for those of you that put 18 tomatoes in a 4x8 uh, garden bed, you don't need to do that. You can get more production out of one if you know what you're doing. So anybody here grow tomatoes? How many pounds of tomatoes do you get off of one plant? Okay. How about you? You grow tomatoes? Yes, I do. How tall do they get? Pardon me? How tall do they get? Um, I would say they get about uh, three and a half feet tall. Okay. And how many pounds of tomatoes do you get off of one plant? I get a, I estimate 25 to 30. Oh, that's good. If you're getting 30 pounds in, 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 with a three-foot plant, you're, you're, you're doing good. You must, you must be watering pretty good. Yeah, yeah, good, good. But what's the what's the potential? The potential is 22 feet, 300 pounds, one plant. That's your potential. The average the average yield of corn in this country is 145 bushels. What's the potential? 1,000 to 1,200. It's all about regenerative farming and and the soil. Um, we're going to talk about amending beds, adding gypsum. Uh, gypsum, you want to add at 42 pounds per acre per year. The reason 42 pounds is because there's 42 inches of rain every year. Um, why do you need a water test? Cover crops and bugs. Regenerative agriculture is based on various agricultural and ecological practices with a particular emphasis on minimal soil disturbance. So there really no, is no such thing as a no-till farm. Because if you stick a, if you stick a spade in, in there and just push it, a, a, a push it away, to put a tomato plant in there, you've disturbed the soil. That's tillage. But you know what I'm getting at. You know what I'm saying when I say we're no-till. I'm not out there with a tiller. We don't have a plow. Um, we have a tractor, but we don't have a plow. Um, we, don't, we, don't, we don't need it. You just do not need it. Um, this lady's uh, work led to innovation in no-till practices, such as slash and mulch in tropical regions. Sheet mulching is a regenerative agriculture practice that smothers weeds and adds nutrients to the soil below. How many of you are in the market to build a new garden bed? Okay. Cardboard. Put the cardboard. Don't dig it up. Just put the cardboard down. Put wood chips on it. Come back next year. Plant into it. Regenerative farming and gardening is up to 78% more productive than any other way to farm. So as an example... If this lady is, is a conventional farmer, for every dollar she makes, I'm making 78. Why would you farm any other way? It makes any sense. Because it's so different. If I went to my grandfather and say, Grandpa, you know, you've got to put azomite and in, in, uh, minerals in the ground, he'd say, why don't you go back to the barn and shovel the cow manure from the cows? Uh, you know. So anyway, unlike conventional agriculture, regenerative farming 
gardening reduces global warming. Why is that? Because we don't open the earth. We don't let the carbon escape. We put the carbon back in. We put biochar in there, which puts the carbon back in there. So the biggest thing about uh, regenerative farming is always keep the soil covered. Never, ever bare soil. Never. Well, one exception, just before you plant. So you don't stop gardening in September and then leave it bare all over the wintertime in the spring. You want to have cover crops, and we're going to get into that in a minute. Minimal soil disturbance, <clears throat> maintaining the living uh, root year round. What that means is, is that when you come to my garden and I ask you to weed a bed, you need to ask me, do you want me to pull them or, or cut them? So when you weed a bed, what do you guys do? You pull it out, right? <laughs> you just, you're, you're stealing all the food for the microbiology. You want to cut it off or weed whack it or flame weed it or solarize it with, with clear plastic, plastic. Leave the root in the ground there's always exceptions, but leave the root in the ground to feed the microbiology. Look at it this way, um, that microbiology is like teenagers. So think of a group of 12 teenage boys. They're going to be standing around playing their, their thumb game there with the phone and stuff like that, and they're not going to be doing much of anything until somebody throws in a basketball, a baseball, a football, and there's competition. And so we, we want to have as much competition going on in the garden as possible, in particular with our native pollinators and our honeybees. The more competition we have with the bees and the other pollinators will force the honeybees to put out four times more honey, which means I'm going to get four times more production because they're going to pollinate it. The same thing in the ground. You always want to have the competition. You have to have a different mentality when you're thinking about regenerative farming. Integrate livestock. We had ducks. Emma, Emma, who was my assistant, we miss Emma. Uh, um, she's got her own farm now. She's doing wonderful, and she's farming regeneratively. She used to have chickens and ducks. I don't know if anyone ever met her duck um, cricket who wears her diaper in the house. <clears throat> Maximize crop diversity. Mother Nature does not have a monoculture. Why do you have a monoculture in the garden? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, agriculture is a primary cause of global warming due to tillage. Regenerative farms don't till. We grow soil. The soil grows the plants. We inoculate every seed with a product called BioCoat Gold which comes from advancing eco-agriculture. So if you go to Holdridge's right now and you say, I need some inoculant, they're gonna give you inoculant for, for peas and beans. We use an inoculant on every single seed. We are duplicating what mother nature does. And by inoculating a seed, what it does is it gives it a better start. You will have a better germination rate. They will tend to germinate together at the same time and it will increase your production. It will also increase, increase the health of the, of the plant. You soak the seeds before planting, most of the time, in a product called Quantum, and I'm gonna cover this in a minute. If you don't take anything else away from this lecture, buy Quantum. I don't care what you're growing. Blueberries, raspberries, apples, peaches, flowers, whatever. You can improve it with quantum. Quantum is not a fertilizer. It is all microbiology. That workforce under your foot is the most important workforce that you can't see without a 400 power microscope. And yes, we use one to look at our soil. You're gonna drench, when you're gonna plant something, you're gonna drench the planting hole or the trench like a trench, if you're going to do seeds in a, in a line and you're going to put a little trench in there, you want to drench, drench that. Um, not necessarily the plant. Some people find it easier if you have a tray of, of, of plants to put that into quantum and drench that first. 
But the best way is to put it right into the hole because that's the new home for the plant. Plant smaller. Don't mess with the life cycle. So this is called critical points of influence. And what this means is you guys all have a life cycle. When you're young, different things are developing. As you go through life um, and, and uh, you, have, um, you want to have a family, that changes your life. Then, then as you get older and you become a grandparent, you, you have this life cycle. Plants have the same thing. They call them critical points of influence. So what the point that I'm getting at is, is that as a plant goes through its life cycle, it changes what it needs constantly. So when a human female gets pregnant, what happens? You eat some really strange stuff sometimes. Because why? Because your body demands something that is in that pickles and ice cream or whatever you're, you're going to have. Um, or your baby wants that. And your body is, is craving that. And that's why you eat this strange stuff. Plants are no different. So, so right now, from this point forward, I want you to start thinking about plants differently. I want you to start thinking about plants as people. Not that you're going to have a conversation with them. Not that you're going to sing them happy birthday. But if you kind of treat them like a person, understanding that, they're trying to communicate with you. They are trying to tell you, I need this, and I don't want that. And I don't like this planted next to me, but I really like this guy over here planted next to me. Start thinking of plants as people. You look at them every day. You touch them. They know you're touching them. They can't tell the difference between your touch and mine, but they know you're touching them. Come see my pawpaw tree. Let me introduce you to my pawpaw tree. And you can see a tree that will, will interact with you um, in about three seconds. It's amazing what this tree does. <clears throat> anyway, we feed our garden regularly. Every single week, every Saturday or Sunday, we feed the garden. We do what is called a foliar. Um, it's also called a drench, where we'll, our volunteers will take watering cans and they'll walk the garden and they'll pour this foliar, which is a combination of a bunch of different things that we put together. Um, for what the plant needs, and we're going to get into that in a minute. And um, you can see a plant response in two days. I've had I've had buck, buckwheat jump eight inches in, in four days. I mean, it's just it's crazy. Um, uh, spinach will jump two inches in two days and change its color, uh, all all because of a foliar and, and what it is that you 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 give to the plant and to the soil. Never let your soil dry out. It's a common mistake with a home gardener is you either water way too much or nowhere near enough. Someone waters your garden every day, whether it's Mother Nature or you. Exception. Grab a wholesome soil, put it in your hand, and squeeze it real hard. If you've got one or two drops of, of moisture coming out between your fingers, that's 50% moisture. But if it's pouring out, it's too wet. So you, you want to maintain moist soil. So you're going to have it mulched. What are you going to mulch it with? Seaweed. If you're not using seaweed, you're nowhere near full production yet. Um, take it right off the beach. No, you don't have to wash it. No, you don't have to let it sit. What's the best salt in the world for you? Sea salt, right? I sneak down, because you know what a farm is. I, I sneak down behind um, Seaview, Seaview, Sea Swirl, whichever one it is, um, right there by the end of the cemetery. I go over there with my, my five-gallon buckets, and people look at like, what's this old fool doing? And, and I go down behind the bushes and get water out of the Mystic River. And then I add it to more water and put it on the, put it on the garden. Ever looked at seawater under a microscope and seen the microbiology that's in there? So uh, one crop out, flip the bed, which means you're going to add you're going to add nutrients to the bed, worm castings, compost, etc. Next crop in two hours. So you need to know in September what you're going to plant in April. 
But you also need to know when you're going to start plants in June or July to get them in in July so that you can continue, you can farm year round with no heat. You don't need heat. Always feed the microbiology, leave the roots, never bare soil. Be observant, watch your, walk your bed every day, because remember that the bugs are there and they're going to be on the bottom side of the leaves. And if you don't walk your garden, you're never going to see them. You're never going to see them. The, the, the little, the flea beetles. Flea beetles are a pain in the neck. You've got to watch your garden every single day. However, if your, if your um, garden plants, bricks, bricks is a measure, measurement of refraction. If they bricks above 12, they are, those plants are indigestible to the bug. The bug's simple um, digestive system cannot digest a high lipid count in, in plants. So that's another reason why regenerative agriculture works so well is because it really raises our bricks numbers. Even our fruit trees are different. That's a completely different story. They don't all have yellow tape on them like that. But we can boost the production in, in a tree in one year just by doing a pretzel prune. You want to know what a pretzel prune is? Come see me. Simply stated, regenerative agriculture is way more productive. We keep the carbon in the soil using naturally available inputs. We were just having a conversation a little while ago about comfrey. Anybody grow comfrey in your garden? Comfrey, put it on your garden. Cut it off. Right now they're all in bloom, right? They're gorgeous and the bees are all over it. Cut it off right at ground level. It'll come back. Put it in water for 10 days. Then take that water, put, mix it with enough water to water your whole garden, put it on your garden, watch your garden jump. Combining, we combine modern science with eons old, old practices used by indigenous peoples and the USDA prior to 1930. If you've ever read a 1930 farmer's book, you'll find out that they were actually gardening and farming kind of the right way until we had World War II and we needed to make chemicals to blow things up. And we had these extra chemicals and wonder what do we do with them? Well, we'll, we'll sell them to the farmers. The farmers will put them on the plant. The plant will grow. Well, that's true, but it kills the microbiology. It's a heck of a lot cheaper than modern agriculture. It's the best way to save our planet and feed our grandchildren. <clears throat> the dreaded soil test. Anybody here able to speak plant? Can you understand what a plant says? Well, then you need a soil test. We use Logan Labs. So here's the deal. For everybody that's here in this room, because there could be 10,000 people out there listening to this, probably not, but there could be a lot of people listening to this. But for every person in this room, if you do a soil test only with Logan Labs, I will read it for you for nothing and tell you what it is that you need in your garden. The only thing you need to give me is your square footage. I want to know what your square footage plantable is. I don't care about your walkways. Tell me what your plantable area is so I can tell you what to put on your garden. A test tells you what's missing in your soil. It also tells you what you have too much of. Too much can be just as bad as not enough. And I'd be willing to bet you that your soil is deficient in sulfur, boron, and manganese. There's hundreds of labs out there. Why do I use Logan Labs? Because they understand regenerative agriculture. And I understand what their targets are. Uh, so if you're going to get a, a soil test, no, you don't need a fancy probe. Go into the kitchen and get a stainless steel spoon. And if you're going to use a shovel, if you've got a stainless steel shovel, that's the best kind. If you've got an old rusty shovel, bring it inside, get a brittle pad, and wash the shovel nice and clean. Otherwise, your iron numbers are going to be up which will be incorrect. Um, you want to dig down six inches. You want to take enough. If this was a garden bed in here, I would probably take eight samples, mix them all together, and send them into the lab. They will email you back with a PDF, and then you email that PDF to me. And then I'll tell you what it is that you, that, that you need. Um, it's about What you want is, is it's about $30 for the test. What you want is a standard test with extras. And when you go to Logan Labs online, you'll, you'll find out how to figure that out. 
It's pretty easy. But if you got questions, you've got my cell phone number. If you don't text me and you don't ask me, that's your problem, not mine. I want to help you. All right. So let's read a test. Um, and when, when you get your test results back, again, send them to me, um, and then we'll we'll do this. And this is for one test, one garden. I had one lady one time said, well, it's one piece of paper. Yeah, but there's five different gardens in there. It takes me an hour to do each one, you know. It's about the law of the minimum. That's kind of a cool picture right there. Um, but an excess can be just as bad as a, de as a deficiency. So I'm not going to get into all the highly technical things about a soil test because you're going to go, oh, my God, this is crazy. I can't do this. But I will tell you this. This is what a soil test looks like. So one of the easiest things to remember is that PPM stands for parts per million. PPA stands for pounds per acre. PPM times 2 equals PPA. So if you have 10 parts per million, that's 20 pounds per acre. Okay. And then I can send you the soil test thing where once you have this with my report on there, you'll also have all the conversion numbers so you don't need me anymore. You can do it yourself next year or next spring. Right? When do you take a soil test? You done one this year? No. Right now. So we look at the sulfur as an example, the anion. <clears throat> so in this particular test, that is 13 parts per million, but the target is 75. The organic matter percentage is 17.57. I like at least 10%, so that's a, good, that's a good number. If you are gardening and you've used a lot of the um, compost from the dump, um, they recognize that as a soilless medium. So your exchangeable cations will not have double numbers like this one does. So, so look at the calcium right there. It gives you the desired value and the value found. And then you can, you can find out what, what the deficiency is. If you look at the potassium, whoops. Oh, no. There it is. If you look at the potassium, it's deficient, 226 pounds per acre. There's also other things to, to be added into this, and I will help guide you through it, is that there are certain maximums, like manganese. Manganese, you know, 20 pounds per season is it. It takes a while. It takes five years to balance soil. And if you get down to boron, what the target is, is three parts per million. We're at 704. And you think, wait a minute, that's way too much. Yeah, but. Here's, so here's the yeah, but. We're not going to talk about plant sap analysis today. But a soil test tells you this is what is in the soil. Right? It doesn't mean that this is what's available to the plant because maybe it's not plant available. It's not chelated. The plants can't take it up. There's not enough microbiology in the soil to, to do the job that needs to be done because a tomato plant can't move and she wants manganese. Does anybody know how a plant gets the microbiology to bring it the thing it, things it needs? So plants, you know, when they got these solar collectors up here, what are they doing? They're taking all this stuff out of the environment, right? Photosynthesizing and all this stuff. And they're turning, she's turning it into what? Sugars, right? So she's a baker, right? She's a baker. Now, I personally have a, a love and a craving of brownies. I do most anything for brownies. But a plant will, will let's say that she's making cakes and cookies in her roots. The microbiology has a sweet tooth. It wants that sugar. So the microbiology says, tomato plant, I will give you manganese, but I need brownies. Here we go. Now we got a symbiotic relationship. And it works. And that's how it, that's how it happens. Iron is 60 to 80 parts per million. 
Manganese is 80 to 90 parts per million. Ours is at 51. Usually a soil test, I'll see something in the teens. So that's a lot. And when you stop and consider, I've only got 15 parts per million of manganese in the soil, and I need 90. What, is, what does manganese do? We don't have time to, 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 to be able to go into an in-depth discussion with all these different things and what they bring to the plant. But if you want to know, text me. Tell me that you want the slideshow about soil tests, and I'll send it to you. And it will tell you every single thing that's on a soil test and why it's important to the plant. Why should you care whether she gets manganese or not? How many fruit does your tomato plant set in clumps of five? You want to double or triple that? Get your manganese levels up. Um, copper is eight parts per million, cobalt's two, etc. So here's the point. The point is, is that Here's your soil test. Here's what yours says. This is what your target is. But if you don't do a soil test, you won't know any of that. And you may have something that's missing in your soil, because I bet you do, um, th that you don't know about because you haven't done a soil test. Remember, it's only Logan Labs. That's the only lab that I'll do. And there's a reason for it, but we won't, we won't go into that. Microbiology trumps everything. That's what you really want to focus on. Not necessarily the calcium or the potassium or the manganese or whatever. It's, it's the living creature workforce that's in the soil that you need to increase. Even 20 years ago, our soil no longer had the microbiology it needed to work the soil. You can add all of the needed amendments to the soil and it will not have the same plant response of 70, 50, or 20 years ago. You must add microbiology compost, worm castings, quantum, and other ways to add life to the soil, like compost teas. Um, I'm going to get into, at the end here, I'm going to get into some books to suggest for you. That's very good reading. So let me stop for just a second. That You have a question? Can you hold your question to the end? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to get to that in about three slides, I think. Just give me a minute. Um, not everybody wants to buy uh, amendments. You need manganese. You need boron. You, not everybody wants to go out and buy a gallon of that when you only need a teaspoon, right? So what do you do? You can get it from around your garden, things that are in, in the garden. Leaf mold is extremely good for, for making a compost tea. But you really can't live without worm castings. You need worm poop. It is amazing what worm poop will do to your garden. And most, most of our plants this year, under every single plant, we put a little pinch of, of worm castings. It's, it's amazing. Slow release nitrogen. It's great. Um, so, the, so the slide after this one's quantum. Um, foliar feeding your plants in soil. Nigel, Nigel Palmer's book. Um, he's a great man. He's a friend of mine. He's, he's been down to the garden a couple times. And if you get a copy of his book, then you can find out how to use the plants that you have available around your area to make a foliar um, for, for your garden. In other words, he has recipes. There's recipes in, in there. But if you just want to do something simple, um, buy some quantum and some Neptune Harvest tomato and vegetable fertilizer. The key is, is that you're going to do a foliar. What's the difference? Modern agriculture puts 10 pounds of 10, 10, 10 on the soil. That's like you eating something, right? This way, we're doing a foliar, which means you just went to the doctor, you stuck a needle in your arm, and gave you an immediate injection. Just like that, you changed. So doing a foliar, especially in the morning, the stomata of the plant, underneath the plant is, is the openings un, underneath the, the plant leaf. A plant wants to be fed before 8 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes I'm out in the garden with a headlight at 2 o'clock in the morning doing stuff. And everybody's laughing at me. But it works. So uh, you want to make sure you wet all the leaves of your plants. Why don't you want to water at night? Are you rather water at night? 
right? Mold and and slugs, right? Unless you're using seaweed. Slugs don't like seaweed. So this is quantum. Again, if you don't do anything else, but buy some buy some quantum for your biweekly fullers. If you want to do them every two two weeks, the mixing um, recipes are on the jug. Um, and we get this do donated from from Joe at Green Earth Ag and Turf. I can't say enough good about him. God bless him. He he has donated to us <coughs> every year since 2015, I believe. And you will see a plant response almost overnight. Um, um, also, the Neptune Harvest tomato and, and vegetable uh, um, formula is very, very good. It makes it easy for you. You can put that on as a foliar as well. Minerals. De demineralization occurs rapidly on intensively farmed and tropical soils. Uh, rock dust can reverse this pro process, restoring life to the soil. In other words, all the minerals that God put in the soil before we came along we we released it because we plowed and it's gone and the runoff from the water and it's gone so you need to add minerals to the to the soil only with remineralization can the soil's ecosystem obtain the nutrients they need to reproduce lay down their bodies and make a stable humus vital for plants animals and humans to thrive on as they once did before we demineralized the earth. Azomite, you can get it at Wesley Agway. Um, the best way to go, it's about a about dollar a pound. Um, you put that on at 200 pounds per acre the first year and 100 pounds per acre thereafter. You put that on your garden, you're gonna see a change. I'm telling you right now, you're gonna see a change, not only in what it looks like, um, not only in the color green, but what it tastes like. This is your soil test. A lot right here in your mouth. When you pick up a, a tomato and you bite into a tomato and you, and, and, and you notice how good it is, it's because of what's in the soil is making the taste of that tomato taste so good. Basalt is another one that we add to the soil um, for balancing overall soil health. Basalt stands out from other rock materials as well. And carbonatite. Um, increases the nutrient and health giving value of all that, that farms and gardens produce for human and livestock consumption. So I take azomite, basalt, carbonatite on my own farm, put it on my pastures where my cows are. And, and Firefly Farm in North Stonington, he does the same thing. Um, and that's why his, his, his meat is so good, is because of the, the flavor of all of those things um, that you have put into the soil that have been transferred to the grass, that have been transferred to the cow. Would you like to have a plate of food with no salt or no pepper? Probably not. Now, I use way too much salt, but th that's kind of what all these minerals are going to do. They're going to give you that flavor boost, just like putting a little bit of salt on your hamburger. Biochar is something else that's important, and, and most people say, biochar? What the heck is biochar? So biochar is a charcoal-like substance that made from burning organic material from agriculture and forestry waste. It's burned without oxygen. It's a process called paralysis. And, and you can buy this. You don't need to make it, make it yourself. You don't need to get 55-gallon drums and make something to make biochar. You can buy it in a bag, or you can buy it in a 1,000-pound tote, whatever you need it for. And what you're going to do with that is put it on your garden and it will a one square inch of biochar if you had a a sharp enough knife knife to slice that <clears throat> and unfold it it would cover a football field it provides a home for the microbiology keeps the keeps the carbon in the soil and really boosts your plant production during the process, process, the organic material is converted into biochar, a stable form of carbon that can't easily escape into the atmosphere. The energy or heat created during paralysis uh, can be captured and used as a form of clean energy, and you can make wood vinegar from it. Whole another subject. But some of you probably use liquid smoke, right? In the kitchen, that's wood vinegar. 
Try that on your plants and see what happens with your plants. Another off the wall thing we do is 30% hydrogen peroxide. You don't, want to, you don't want to be careful with 30% hydrogen peroxide, but it increases the oxygen in the soil. Feed the garden with a spray at least every other week. So they say when to apply it, <clears throat> when the birds start to sing in the morning and when the dew settles in the evening. You can also make compost teas out of worm castings, out of compost, out of your lawn clippings if you don't have a lawn company putting chemicals on your lawn. Um, or you can use a backpack mister, so we use both. So the volunteers walk around with cans, sprinkle cans, and I'm very specific. On this section here, I want two cans per row, not one and a half, not two and a quarter, got to be two, because I know exactly how much water to put into my tanks to feed every, <coughs> excuse me, every single plant in my garden. And if you put two and a half cans, of foliar in a particular part of my garden, I'm not going to have enough left. So now we're going to have somebody that's hungry. And that's not good. The backpack mister we use for all of our fruit trees, apple, peach, pear, all of our blueberry bushes, um, our elderberries, you should see our elderberries. Uh, works out very well. What about spacing? What is SRI? It's a system of rice intensification where the Oriental folks found out that if they planted 25% less rice tillers in a given area, they'd get a 400% increase in production. So we plant our tomato plants 60 inches apart, but we prune them, which is what those little white things are. Those are called tomahawks. We prune one plant into three. So when the suckers come up, and if you don't, everybody know here know how to prune a tomato plant? If you don't, come see me. I'll teach you. Um, you can make it into three. And that works out very well. No monoculture. So with our tomatoes. So it's hard to see here. Oops, I did it again. There we go. Let me put it to you this way. If we have a, a row of tomatoes in the center, right? On the outside, two rows of onions. This is in a 30-inch bed. Two rows of onions, two rows of carrots, and a, whoops, and a single row of tomatoes with four basil plants around every tomato plant, or at least two, and borage about every 20 feet, so all to attract the pollinators. Tomatoes, you ever made marinara sauce? What do you put in it? Onions, tomatoes, basil, it works in the, in the food. It also works in the garden. What about cucumbers and making pickles? What do you do with that? What do you add with pickles? Dill. Grow dill with your pickles. So you want to look, about, look up about um, companion planting. And I know you can't read that whole thing there, but it, there are a lot of, there's a lot of information online about com companion planting. And you'll find that if you come to Coogan, you'll find that we do an awful lot of that. Um, our our uh, potato rows, as an example, they are bordered by two rows of beans. Why is that? Because beans fix nitrogen, right? What's that do for the... So I have a volunteer that I've had covering up the, the potatoes every day for the past two weeks. And they keep on growing. And we cover them completely. You can't see any green. The next day, boop, there, there they come. And, and we do that so that it increases our production. Don't forget to attract on, uh, pollinators and deter pests by the flowers that you have. So uh, Deb came to the garden one day, and you know, as, as she usually does when she walks in the gate, what do you need me to do? And if she wants to get to work and get, get something done. I said, I need, you to, I need you to plant some flowers for me. So... This is your canvas. There's the flowers. I don't know how many I've got, a thousand flowers. Do what you want. And her face lit right up. And she did. I have no idea where she planted stuff, but we'll find out when it comes into bloom. And the garden is going to be absolutely gorgeous, and you need to come see it. Amending the beds. So before you plant, 
And when you flip the bed, and what I mean by flipping the bed is you take the crop out, you amend the bed, and then you prep it to put in the next crop. What are you going to follow it with? So uh, we always add compost. And if you don't want to spend the money to, to buy compost from someplace else, you can go to, to um, the, the dump and use their, their stuff. And that's a derogatory term, I guess, maybe. Um, the, the studies in landfill is a better term for it. Um, and I have tested their soil, and it's, it's good. You can use that. Or you can go to Earth Care Farm in Charleston, Rhode Island. I've got 10 slides to get through in about five minutes. So uh, gypsums, I already talked to you about that. Test your water. Why do you want to test your water? Because I want to know what the hardness is. Any hardness above 70 parts per million will reduce the effectiveness of any amendment you put on the soil up to 75%. And city water's got chlorine and chloramine in it. What's that? Why is that in there? It's meant to kill bacteria. What are you trying to grow? Bacteria and fungi. Cover crops. Never bare soil. Multi-species cover crops. 15, 20, 30 different things, including all your old seeds that you don't want to keep anyway for next year. Put them in for a cover crop. But things like hairy vetch, mustard, buckwheat, white clover, red clover, oilseed radish, which is a daikon radish, which you can eat, and they'll get about this big around and about this long, and they'll, they'll go right through hard pan. If you've got hard soil you can't stick your hand in, you need oilseed radish. And if you've got pigs, they love them. Uh, crimson clover and, again, all those old seeds. So the bad bugs, uh, do I need to list them? We know there's a load of bad bugs out there. Um, so what are you going to do? Just spray them. What happens when you do that? You don't kill just the potato beetles. You don't kill just the squash bugs. You're killing the microbiology in the soil that you have spent money and time trying to grow, and now you say, well, I'm just going to spray them. Better to use diatomaceous earth or kaolin clay on your plants or spray them with some soapy water or go around when you're looking at your plants and hand pick them. They don't bite. Mush them. It's nice to mush them. So healthy soil, healthy plant, healthy human. You want your bricks over 12, cover it with seaweed. Your seaweed has a natural pesticide in there. Um, uh, yellow sticky traps, you can get those from Arbico Organics in California. We just got ours in along with 10,000 um, green lace wings. I just put into the garden yesterday, and I've got another 10,000 coming. John Kemp, if you ever want to learn a lot about regenerative farming, go to um, advancing Eco Agriculture and John Kemp's page, and he's got all kinds of information. But magnesium, sulfur, molybdenum, and boron with a little bit of sugar, and the, the bugs actually blow up. It's cool. It's got, you've got bug, bug guts all over the garden. <laughs> so books. Here's the, here's the books. So the No-Till Intensive Vegetable Culture is by Brian O'Hara. He is a very successful regenerative farmer in Lebanon, Connecticut, and he's doing wonderful work there. He's, he also um, is on YouTube, and you can uh, go to YouTube and, and see some of his videos. Um, if you need some, some direction, text me, and I'll, I'll send you um, some links that you can go to. Um, Will Bonsall's Essential Guide to Radical Self-Reliant Gardening. Um, you notice he and I kind of look a lot like each other. We have some fun at the Maine Organic Farmers um, um, Fair, and nobody knew which one, which guy was Will Bonzo. Um, the Holistic Orchard. Uh, sadly, Michael had a heart attack, but the good thing is his heart attack occurred while he was in the orchard, the place he loved to be. Uh, um, but great book if you want to know about vegetable uh, trees, rather. And, and what to do in your in your orchard. He has recipes as well. Yes, they need to be spread, sprayed and, and fed um, just like your garden does. And then Nigel's uh, book, The Regenerative Grower's Guide to Garden Amendments. Um, it is a fantastic book. It's, it's not a, a, a not a big book, uh, but the recipes that are in there, um, they are to die for. 
and the plants are are just reaching out saying please get this book and 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 use it and and feed your feed your garden right from your garden um there's also another one out there if you're really interested in the old way of doing things um jadam which which is um the korean natural farming and a lot of good information in there we combine all of that stuff for our garden every day something different you know again thinking about plants as people you do not want to have a bone-in ribeye three meals a day seven days a week for the rest of your life neither does your microbiology change what you feed it so thank you for having me and uh, bring on the question Yes, ma'am. You have a question. Yep. That's okay. I look. So the question basically is, is um, can you scale this down a little bit? I'm not farming 10,000 acres. Um, I'm farming a four by six or six by eight uh, or, um, garden. It doesn't make any difference whether you're, whether you're, um, we don't have any garbage cans here, whether you're growing in a garbage can or 10,000 acres, soil is soil. It's treated the same way. The disadvantage of a small plot is the availability of some of the specialty items that your plants may require. You don't want to buy a 50 pound bag of something when all you need is a teaspoon. There is a solution. Come see me. I have, I have resources, right? Um, so yes, you do everything the same way. You're going to prepare the soil the same way. Yes, you need to take the soil test. The size of your garden has nothing to do with knowing what's in there. You still need to know what's in there. And so a four by eight bed, if you took three samples out of each one and, and, and built that up to two cups and send that into Logan Labs, then, then we can read that for you and tell you what, what you need. And, and so I think the smallest garden I've ever uh, done a consult for Four was 32 square feet, which is, yeah, exactly. Did that answer your question? Okay. Yes, ma'am. So can I describe how to how to introduce seaweed in the garden? Truck, manure fork, good shoulders. So go to the beach. The people on Ash Street. They will kiss you. They will give you money. Get the seaweed out of Ash Street, right? Or go to Esco Point Beach. Or go to any beach that's facing a, a south shore after a storm that comes in from the south. And you, can, you can pick it up in garbage bags or five-gallon buckets. Or if you have a truck, you can fork it into the back of the truck. The best implement to do that with is a manure fork, not a pitchfork. A manure fork, that's the best utensil to use to pick up the seaweed. Pick it right up off the beach, and yeah, you're going to get a little bit of, of, of uh, sand in there. That's actually a good thing. And you're going to get a quitters in there. You may get horseshoe crabs and periwinkles and all this other kind of stuff. And this is all great for your garden. Bring it home, unload it, wherever it is that you want, it, you want to put it. And then when you go to put it in your garden, you're going to mulch your plants, right? So, so we want it to be about four inches or so um, thick. And um, if you have a drip irrigation system, I put the drip tape on top of it because it's the only way you can tell if the drip tape is leaking. Um, it makes more sense to have the drip tape under it. But and we all do know that watering from above is the worst, right? Especially for tomatoes. Tomatoes don't like wet leaves. Please, they want choker hoses or drip tape or whatever. But you want to cover your whole bed with seaweed 
what you don't want to do is when you first put a seed in the ground and it just pops its head up and you get the first two leaves that, that come up, it's too early. You want it to be like three or four inches tall before you put the seaweed on there. And you may, you may need to reapply it. The advantage of seaweed also, it just doesn't blow away. It's not like using shredded leaves. Keyword shredded. If you're going to put, tell your husband, don't throw away the leaves anymore. Don't burn them. Don't throw them over the stone wall. Run the lawn mower over them about 900 times and then put it on your garden. It's good stuff. Any other questions? You guys are way too easy. Yes, ma'am. So the question is about seaweed, and um, is there good seaweed and is there bad seaweed? Um, the bad seaweed would be the seaweed that stinks, because when it stinks, it's gone anaerobic. And you don't want to put anything that's anaerobic on your garden, which means without oxygen. Right? Um, around here, the seaweed that you're going to get from the beach, there's no seaweed that I have yet seen that you can't put on your garden. Um, we usually Try to get eelgrass when we can get it. It looks like confetti in a way. Um, and, you know, it's about an eighth of an inch wide and long strands. And it all mats together, or I guess it intertwines together so that it doesn't blow away. Um, but I've not seen anything here. Now, this is Stonington, Connecticut. Virginia Beach or Florida or California, I, I can't speak to that. But around here... Um, any seaweed that you can get off the beach is going to be good for your garden. Yeah. And why seaweed? Seaweed has seaweed is a facilitator. Seaweed has the ability to unlock trace nutrients in the soil that are not normally plant available. Um, it's got a pesticide and herbicide. Um, it adds minerals to the soil. I mean, this stuff is fantastic, and you're not using it, and it's free. Oh my God, it'll change your garden. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate it. Come on.